Welcome to Bloomberg Intelligence. BI provides research on industries, companies, and expert topics, delivering key data from BI analysts in their given industry. Now, here is your Bloomberg Intelligence research team. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rob Barnett, and I'd like to welcome you to the BI Energy Exchange, where we talk about our research and the latest developments in the market. I hope everyone's had a good week so far, and I hope you're not uh, subject to some of the ongoing wave of coronavirus uh, pandemic that still seems to be unfolding in certain parts of the world. I think that's going to be a, a good starting point for us this week. If you've seen the numbers in India, they're very troubling. I think we're seeing something like 250,000 new cases a day in the country right now. And if you're following the oil market, I don't think it's any surprise, but India has been one of the strong growth markets over the last few years for oil. And the current pace of the pandemic there certainly seems to challenge the narrative about a rebound in oil demand this year, at least it seems to. So with that, I want to bring on both Sally Omaz and Will Harris to talk about kind of how we're seeing demand fundamentals at the moment. And so we'll start with you, Sally. What's your read for how this uh, this this pretty troubling set of uh, pandemic numbers look uh, for oil demand? Sure. Thanks, Rob. I mean, it is, I must say, it is quite tragic I mean, the situation in uh, India at the moment. I mean, we are seeing a number, the number of cases surging, hospitalizations and deaths, which are nearing about 2,000. Uh, a day, uh, and which we are hearing may even be underestimations. So we are already seeing, I mean, a couple, on Monday, we've, we've got some news on um, one of the major refineries uh, cutting refinery runs already. Uh, I mean, it is no surprise that uh, this is a bearish indicator uh, for, uh, for oil demand recovery this year, because India, as you mentioned, has been seen, I mean, this is the third largest consumer of oil in the world. Um, and this is where really hopes for uh, uh, recovery in demand uh, was really around uh, in, in Asia. So uh, I think globally looking at this, uh, to me, it looks like, um, unfortunately, pandemic is far from over. I mean, I think we would all like it to be over as, as soon as possible, um, but uh, it isn't. And we will see demand recovery this year, I think very much skewed towards the second half. But we are, uh, I mean, it is almost earning season as well, and we are looking at 1Q numbers and, and um, already April numbers, and the first half of the year isn't looking so great for the oil demand recovery, I'm afraid. And Will, I want to get your perspective on this. Obviously, most of the oil and gas companies out there are seeing better fundamentals with the much improved commodity price versus where we were a year ago. Uh, but demand still looks like a problem, uh, at least uh, at least here in the first half. How how, how are you seeing this uh, feed into one Q and beyond for the oil majors? Yeah, absolutely. So, but I think there's a there's a few elements at play here for one Q uh, reporting season, which is coming up next week for European oil majors. I I think first is uh, really in the spotlight is going to be capital returns. Uh, which, which, which may be a, a little bit contradictory, g given um, given some of the uh, demand concerns we're seeing near term, but it, but this is really a function of um, uh, sharply increased free cash flow nearly across the board from these companies. This is from their um, strict capital discipline that many of these companies have uh, have instituted through last year and are and are broadly maintaining this year. Uh, and then, of course, with with much improved uh, commodity pricing, not just oil at above sixty dollars a barrel uh, average for the first quarter, but we're also seeing very strong uh, natural gas benchmarks at around five dollars per mm BTU, and also very strong um, LNG benchmarks uh, as well. So, so we think we could see, and and we've already seen some some uh, suggestions and pre announcements from from some of these companies uh, announcements for small dividend bumps. And uh, and resumption of of buyback programs, with, which uh, BP strongly uh, alluded to uh, in a recent one Q trading update. Um, but I, I think overall these these companies are are very 
eager to to show to the market and their investors that they're that they're on the the recovery path from um, from the pretty devastating last year where we saw um, really sharp dividend uh, reductions from nearly across the board, with the exception of Total. Now, Sally, I want to get your read across on oil macro as well. So obviously, we've got improving fundamentals, but what, what's the what's the risk? Do you, do you see downside risk, particularly because of the demand fundamentals, Iran, other factors? I know we've got a, another OPEC meeting coming up. Uh, what's your read on the tea leaves right now for just the uh, the, the the underlying commodity? Sure. So, I mean, Brent uh, is holding up uh, rather well. It's, at last I checked this morning, it was at uh, sixty-six dollars a barrel, and I think at the moment it is a tug of war between uh, hopes of demand recovery uh, as as fast as possible. But, uh, versus uh, worries around uh, India, as we mentioned, but just generally uh, uh, surging cases and also concerns around uh, efficacy of vaccines uh, on a poten- the potential new variants that we might see. Um, so, I mean, with that in mind, uh, we are seeing that there is supposed to be an OPEC meeting next week. Um, but what we heard is that uh, it may not be the full ministerial meeting, but just the monitoring committee. I mean, it is the holy month of Ramadan uh, this month, and uh, m- many of the OPEC plus nations are observing. So this kind of makes sense. But I think one read through f- from that may be that um, they're very unlikely to change course. They are still planning to add uh, gradually some more output because they are expecting demand to recover in the next three months as summer approaches. I think in terms of, I mean, again, uh, Brent at 66, but there are a few catalysts that we're watching. And the, um, I mean, we are also, we, we do also have our eyes uh, on Vienna and the uh, US-Iran nuclear talks, where an agreement really would allow Iran to uh, bring back up to 1.5 million barrels a day uh, of oil back into the market, which is quite significant. So this is definitely one of the potential bearish signals that uh, that we that we're watching in the market. Yeah, I I think it's very interesting the, to see the prospect for additional output from say in Iran, coupled with continued demand weakness. Maybe just get you to weigh in on one more component of demand. We talked about the angle about what's unfolding in India, but we also updated our outlook for the jet fuel component of demand uh, last week. And one of the things that if if you're following the oil market, jet fuel, at least prior to the pandemic, was about 8% of the global total for oil demand. And so clearly the aviation industry is struggling to reboot and get things back, uh, back to normal. Sally, how would you characterize the sort of research and kind of how things may unfold over the next one to two years? Sure. I mean, this is an interesting one because we are hearing the airline CEOs talk about summer holidays and clearly they they are hopeful for it. But the more we kind of hear about the virus news and uh, how this may not be over anytime soon, it's pretty unclear uh, where the jet fuel demand, which is, as you said, uh, about used to be about 8% of total oil demand, prior to the pandemic. I mean, we hosted uh, a roundtable with two CFOs uh, from European refiners last week. And even there, we got a little bit of a mixed signal uh, from the CFO of CFOs, uh, one of them saying that they are getting uh, slightly more interest from airlines uh, for jet fuel as they're starting to stock up uh, for the summer. Uh, and th- that was uh, Motor Oil Hellas, one, one of the Greek refiners. And then we also had OMV CFO who, who, who said that they are a little bit more cautious on jet fuel uh, recovery because, I mean, uh, travel restrictions are still in place and it is unclear uh, when those will be lifted exactly. So I think uh, there will probably be less restrictions than right now, but it is unclear uh, what it will look like exactly. So I think it is um, probably prudent to be cautious about uh, the, the middle distillates and the uh, and the jet fuel demand recovery uh, as well. Yeah, I think you've got to be an eternal optimist, particularly right now if you're an airline CEO. There's a lot of uh, 
a lot a lot to be desired from from that segment of demand at least here in the short run okay so i want to shift gears a little bit and talk about a, a continuing type of development we've seen in the market over the last two three years it just seems like the drumbeat for a green recovery a green economy is growing And just yesterday, we saw the UK come out and say that it's planning to cut its emissions 78% by 2035 versus the 1990 level. Now, in reality, we're already halfway to that goal, but it represents another sea change for what the fossil economy may look like over the next few decades. And so I want to bring Will Hares back on. We put out a note looking at this topic, but help us frame this kind of thinking. What does what does the UK announcement potentially mean for oil demand and gas demand uh, as you as you read the tea leaves? Yeah, thanks Rob. So so the UK's new updated target is um 78% emissions reduction by 2035 from a 2019 base. <clears throat> And the country has um, has already achieved nearly half of that, but still, this is a uh, this is a big reduction. And and how we see it filtering through into oil demand is 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 pretty interesting. So um, UK emissions uh, from the transport sector comprise about a third of total emissions, and and we think that oil demand in the UK, domestic oil demand, could fall by roughly a third over the next uh, by by 2030. Uh, and, and this is this is largely as a function of of efficiency and in, in rising efficiency in cars, but also uh, increasing penetration of electric vehicles, and particularly against um, the UK's uh, recently updated uh, targets to ban internal combustion engine sales by 2030. This is the the second most ambitious or aggressive target globally, only behind Norway, which is at 2025. Which, which we think positions the, the UK uh, very aggressively on on the phase out of, of these vehicles, and and will definitely um, carry through into in, into lower oil demand over the uh, over the coming year. Yeah, it's very interesting thinking through what an ice ban potentially means for oil demand, but the logic isn't isn't that absurd, right? You know, if you if you're going to take oil based cars off the road. You're going to see potentially uh, demand come off from that. Uh, if we flip out of the transport space for a second, obviously there is read across into gas demand from this type of announcement as well. Will, when you think about the the gas portfolios of the oil majors, you know, is 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 a is the rush to curb emissions? At least in the near term, is it net positive? Is it is it is it a sort of wash? How do you, how do you see it? Because gas is clearly the uh, the lowest carbon of the fossil fuels. Yeah, so that, that's it's been a trend that, that that's been going on for several years now. Uh, a, a gradual increasing uh, weighting in the production mix of of oil majors towards gas and away from oil, and I think it, that. In part, reflects uh, the the lower carbon intensity of of gas as as the the, the cleanest burning fossil fuel as they call it, um, but it, but also a, a greater focus on um, on LNG in in most of these oil majors portfolios, which is uh, large scale, uh, which requires large scale gas resource uh, to develop and and is becoming increasingly commodified around the world. Um, but it, but yeah, it, it it is forming one of one of the the major levers uh, that, that these oil majors have. But but I'm as you mentioned with with the the green trend and the transition really accelerating, we're seeing pressure now um, on on the natural gas production of, of of these companies from from investors from an ESG standpoint, and and I think that's why we're also seeing um, sort of early stage expansion into into renewables from. Uh, from many of the European oil majors. Thank you, Will. Okay, so Elchin, you're our utilities analyst, thinking about all kinds of interesting topics these days. What do you make of the green push, particularly in the UK? 
how do you read across into gas demand from the latest announcement? And uh, what what are you watching from from the greening uh, trends? As you know, as you and I have discussed, utilities are probably the at the sort of front end of companies that are pushing to decarbonize. First of all, it's not just the UK. As you know, EU has just uh, said it's going to cut its emissions by fifty five percent by twenty thirty. Uh, just like UK, the benchmark is. 1990 levels emissions. Uh, Biden's administration has just came out with a, a goal of halving its emissions, although it's from 2005 levels where the U.S. emissions were at its highest. So that's a little bit of a fiddling with the number targets. But yeah, the, the trend is there. I do see the, the focus over the next um, uh, next five or to ten years is probably going to be on the transport side of things, where there's going to be more EVs, hybrids, and whatnot. So uh, it will impact gas demand, but I think the impact will be probably backloaded. So the second half of the decade, but we, we are going to see some uh, uh, decline in gas demand. Yeah, uh, after 2025, I think not just in in UK but in Europe as well. It's very interesting. So the idea would be short term. Natural gas looks pretty positive from a demand perspective, but longer term, you've got your doubts kind of hearing the same thing trickling through from Will. So let's watch that space. You know, Elchin, while we're talking about the UK, I know one of the companies you've been looking at is uh, Centrica, and I know you've got uh, an outlook for them and some expectations about some fundamentals that are shifting there. So t- tell us about your, uh, your work on Centrica. I mean, that electrification trend that we talked about is going to benefit Centrica, but it's more of a long-term thing. Uh, In the short term, I'm quite positive on the company because uh, it's one of the utilities that is going to benefit more from not only post-COVID recovery, because it was hit during the COVID uh, pandemic times, but also from the rise in uh, uh, bond yields because the um, the pension liabilities of the companies, which is a huge drag for Centrica, are going to come down. Also, the companies, uh, rightly so, uh, focusing on uh, cost-cutting measures, uh, renegotiating contracts with the unions to make them more in line with the market uh, norms. So I think that the cost base is going to come down. The, on the demand side, is going to improve uh, in the short term because of post-COVID normalization in the long term because of the uh, electrification. Uh, and the, the new CEO is very credible. Um, so I think that's all, all combined that, uh, yeah, I have a very positive outlook for Centrica on that regard. Very interesting. And while, while we're talking about companies specifically, I want to bring on Patricio Alvarez. Uh, Pat, you've uh, just uh, been looking at Inagas. Um, tell us about their latest earnings, where they're headed, and how do they fit in with this green narrative that we've been talking about? Sure. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> so the, the most interesting thing about um, Enagas's earnings, I think, well, is just to remind us that, that the company's in difficult situation in terms of the regulated uh, network activities in Spain due to the incoming regulation, which uh, tightens their, uh, their allowed returns, and, and that's not surprising. Um, on the other hand, the company has decided to pivot uh, towards uh, renewable gases. So that, that builds into the, the narrative that, that you were talking about, which seems to be uh, accelerating uh, with uh, the announcement of an expanded, um, the hydro- the, uh, an expanded version of the plan for, for the EU's uh, hydrogen backbone, uh, which companies like Enegas are, are set to play a significant role in, though there's uh, little sort of a clarity on, on what role or what the extent of the, the investments will be for each company. Um, so the company it is, is on a revenue downtrend, downtrend uh, domestically and um, its investments abroad, um, especially via Tallgrass in the U.S., have been hit hard uh, by their, their exposure and on over leverage. Um, so, so that's sort of the narrative for Enegas. It, I'd say in the recovery mode that hinges mostly on, on their stepping up the renewables um, portfolio and their recovery from tall grass. Very interesting, Patricio. You know, I, I, it's going to be really fascinating to see if some of these gas pipeline operators, distribution type companies, can reinvent themselves as sort of in in sort of the mold of green gas and hydrogen and all of these 
opportunities that that may be lurking for them. And along those lines, uh, we've got another interesting development just from our colleagues at Bloomberg News who are reported that uh, in Germany, the Green Party is leading in a recent poll. And so, you know, we have one more signpost again that the uh, recovery could be green. We could be getting even more, even more disp- disposed politicians who who are thinking in a green way, taking leadership roles in Europe. And so, I think that this probably leads to read across in all kinds of manners. So, Elchin, we'll come back to you first for for uh, thinking through the uh, the read across from the German uh, political polling news. Now, what what do you make of this? Does this have any real impact on an RWE? What do you think it could mean for something like the uh, European carbon allowance prices as well? I mean, just like UK, uh, UK's um, the 2035 uh, increased ambition on climate, what it means is probably um, higher targets for offshore wind. Uh, so I think, for, for example, in the UK, the country um, is going to... Um, have to increase its 40 gigawatts um, offshore wind target, which is very hefty, but we think it's going uh, it's going to be upgraded further. For Germany, I think the, the key problem for the likes of RW and other developers is the fact that the permitting process is a nightmare. It takes forever and this uh, or this court uh, or all that NIMBYs and whatnot. So I think Green Party can definitely try to improve things there. Uh, however, on the European level, I think Green Party will play a more active role um, in form of Germany. Yeah, um, uh, We've already talked about 55% target for 2030, carbon reduction. But what we haven't talked about is that there's a chance that target may be increased to 57%. You know, so uh, I think um, the, the the green government will try to push more uh, uh, easier permitting and more stricter uh, or more ambitious green targets and energy efficiency targets. And finally, on hydrogen, again, the, um, the, there are a bunch of roadmaps around Europe for hydrogen, but I think there's um, there's definitely some room to. Um, uh, to improve the ambition there too. So uh, these areas, I think, where the Green Party will try to um, help, but it's going to be more of a gradual. In the, in the short term, there's really not much going on in terms of uh, impact uh, on the companies. Yeah, I think if you're right, though, on the offshore wind piece of it, I'd keep an eye on Siemens, Gamesa, Vestas. You know, this, this is a good... Uh, uh, demand uh, driver for uh, wind turbines if, if it comes to pass. Uh, Sally, I want to bring you on in this as well. Germany has the distinction of being the largest oil market in Europe. And one of the platforms of the Green Party is that they would like to uh, impose uh, a, a, a ice ban or a fossil fuel phase out for oil based vehicles, however you want to refer to it. Uh, I think they're targeting 2030, so in line with what the UK is discussing. How do you how do you how do you parse that? What do you think it means for oil demand, and who's exposed to it there in uh, Germany? Sure. Um, I mean, as you said, Germany is the largest uh, oil consumer in Europe, with about 2.5 million uh, million barrels a day. Um, and this is, I mean, again, as you said, very similar to the UK. This does have implications for the refiners and the fuel retailers in the country. Um, and when we look at the refining sector, integrated like BP, Shell, OMV, all refine uh, in, in Germany. And when we look at the fuel retailing sector uh, and the market share there, it seems it's BFT, which actually has the biggest market share, then again, BP, Shell, and Total is one of the retailers there. And I think uh, this obviously has implications for them, and it's probably coming faster than they thought. And we will be, I mean, this will have, this will put pressure on the cracks and the refining margins, and perhaps fuel margins in their fuel retailing uh, divisions. Very interesting. And I want to come back to Will Harris again on this point. Uh, Will, you put out a note last week looking at BP and their emissions targets. 
Now, the emissions targets that BP is talking about in many ways align with the kinds of things you're hearing from the UK government or potential Green Party-led government in Germany. How's, how's BP approaching this? Do you think they're on track to hit emissions reductions, and how are they going to do it? Yeah, thanks, Rob. So, yeah, BP put out their 2020 sustainability report uh, recently, and probably the highlight from it is uh, is their emissions from last year, which showed really strong progress on emissions reduction. Uh, and and our analysis of of this data suggests that um uh, that, that that they're probably going to hit their near term emissions targets. Uh, now, one one part that that it's uh, that's definitely worth noting is that there was a significant pandemic effect in uh, in BP's emissions profile last year, um, and also a major driver in its um, over 10% reduction year over year was was its um, major divestments made last year, which included its entire um, legacy Alaskan portfolio. Um, but it, but the, the company overall has has three main objectives uh, in, uh, in in emissions. So they have their scope one and two ob- uh, objective. Which is to reduce by 30 to 35 percent by uh, by 2030, and and given that that they've um, that they've reduced 19 uh, percent uh, already, we we think that, that the company is is well on track for uh, for to to meet this target. Um, they've they've also included a, a scope three target as as well, 20 uh, percent by 2030, and uh, and and the company's uh, pretty well on on track for for that as well. And and sort of how how are they achieving this emissions reduction? It's really um, a, a few levers. Uh, number one is is they're increasing um, operational efficiency around the portfolio, so reducing flaring um, uh, and and venting. Um, and number two, they're they're investing in um, in uh, more gas weighted uh, assets, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And, and, and gas has a much lower uh, carbon intensity than uh, than um, and oil, and we're also seeing them branch out into uh, into renewables. And BP has has been a bit of a, a late comer to this, um, but but we've seen some very active M um, and A from them uh, in in offshore wind in the U.S., uh, in the U.K., uh, and in solar. And then finally, um, much like most other European oil majors, BP is um, is going to have to uh, invest in carbon capture. That's both organic and in, inorganic. Um, to help achieve their ultimate net net zero uh, target by 2050. Thank you, Will. We know even if oil companies are moving towards these net zero targets, and even if demand uh, could be muted in the short term, we're still going to need lots of investment in uh, upstream resources because of the decline rate of the industry. So I think there's still lots of upstream activity happening. And on that front, I want to bring on Pat one more time to just walk us through uh, an interesting topic he was just looking at with offshore Guyana. Tell us about what's going on there, uh, who are the players, and how exciting is that play in in your view as, um, as you think about the oil patch? Sure. Um, so, uh, offshore Guyana is not um, is not a new kid on the block. Let's say um, has an exploration frontier. It's been gaining prominence uh, since 2015 after uh, Exxon's Liza discovery, uh, with su- uh, successive discoveries um, building up a resource base of about nine billion barrels uh, offshore Guyana, uh, which is quite significant. And uh, it also um, comes with a, an attractive economic model of about. $35 uh, break even, um, which to us represents sort of the next chapter of oil and gas in Latin America. It's aligned um, in, in, certain, in a certain way with the oil major's uh, way of extracting oil, if that makes sense, with low carbon intensity, low break even costs, and, and large, large scale. Um, and we also highlight that these sort of developments um, do not come with the above ground risk um, that onshore developments um, portray in, in Latin America. Um, as into the major players there, we see Exxon continue to build up uh, with follow-on discoveries around their acreage, while uh, Total and Apache are set to drill a few wells uh, on the Suriname side of the basin. 
Um, and the interesting thing that our note shows is uh, basically the, the, the tracker of the wells this year. We see more than 15 wells to be drilled, with some of them being quite material. And another thing uh, that's interesting is a few ju junior um, EMPs have exposure to, to some of these wells, which could um, change, let's say, their, um, their scale and their growth ambitions, certainly. Okay. Thank you, Patricio. I think we'll have to leave it there. I want to thank everyone for joining us this week. Uh, feel free to reach out to us anytime over message or IB. And of course, you can find our research at BIGO. I hope everyone has a great uh, afternoon.